We're very pleased to have David Seeley and um, Bill Hamlin as speakers. David R. Seeley is a professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University. He earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in Near Eastern Studies. He has published on various biblical topics, the Temple and the Book of Mormon. He is one of the team of editors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. William J. Hamlin, PhD, University of Michigan, is professor of history at Brigham Young University, specializing in the medieval and ancient Near Eastern. His most recent books are Warfare in the Ancient Near East to 1600 BC, Holy Warriors of the Dawn of History, Rutledge 2005, and with David Seeley, Solomon's Temple Myth and History. He's also published numerous articles on Mormon studies. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Professor Seeley and, and Hamlin. We're really pleased today to talk before Dan Peterson, because we know you won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> but we also know since you won't leave, we're not in a very big hurry, but we are in a big hurry. Solomon's Temple. We just finished a book on this, but we're really not here to talk about the book. We're here to talk about an idea. This book is not the story of a place, but of an idea whose origins lie before the dawn of history and whose culmination extends beyond the apocalyptic twilight of mankind. For nearly half of mankind, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, the site of the temple remains one of the most sacred spots on earth. The influence of the Temple of Solomon on history, culture, religion, ritual, music, mysticism, art, and architecture has been enormous. Primarily, Solomon's temple epitomizes the idea of a golden, ever sought for moment when God dwells among us. This is a topic that has great interest for Latter-day Saints, as I'm sure you know. This is the cover we chose for our book, because of course, Bill Hamblin and David Seeley wanted to write a book called Solomon's Temple in History and Myth. But you'll quickly see that the people that make books said, myth and history is better. So in the front of our book was gonna be an actual picture of a real temple in real time in a real place, 968 BC, Mount Moriah, Jerusalem. These guys actually captured better what we're here to talk about. The temple is an idea. This is a Gothic cathedral. And the people building this cathedral thought in a very real way they were building the temple there. And this picture does capture this idea, the idea that even 2,000 years later, Solomon's temple has a huge interest amongst the three great world religions and in fact is a, is a part of almost all the newscasts every single day uh, in, in world politics. Our book consists of five chapters. And once again, we're not here to talk about the book, we're here to talk about an idea. The idea that we have consists of five parts. The first part is Israelite temples in the ancient Near East. Second is temple traditions in Judaism, the Christian temple, Islam and the temple of Solomon, and finally modern conceptions of Solomon's temple, which includes Latter-day Saints, by the way, and there is a short chapter in our book about Latter-day Saints. It turns out as we started pursuing this idea that no one's ever written a book quite like this before. You know there's quite specialized scholarship in all of these five areas, we never found any word that put these all together, and in particular, the section on Islam, which Professor Hamlin will talk about in just a moment. My job is simply to get you through Israelite temples, temple traditions in Judaism, and the Christian temple. And we need to move quickly here because we have lots and lots of pictures. We discovered something we already knew, actually, from Hugh Nibley, that Solomon's temple is part of a wider ancient Near Eastern temple tradition. And we were trained at BYU under Professor Nibley to always look for the temple everywhere as the centerpiece of all ancient culture. There's five ideas that we want to touch upon really quickly here. Number one, it's the dwelling place on earth of God. Number two, the temple is a gateway to God's dwelling place in the heavenly temple. Number three, Garden of Eden imagery is part of this wider ancient Near Eastern temple tradition consisting of trees, living water, and cherubim. Gradated sacred space creates for the worshiper a journey to God. And in terms as Latter-day Saints, this might be the most important thing about temples. They teach us about our journey back to the presence of God. And finally, the journey mediated by priesthood and consists of prayer and sacrifice are the two main things that uh, were, were present in ancient uh, Near East. First temple in the Bible is actually the Tower of Babel. And there's a very, very interesting story, and it raises a very interesting question that we don't have all the answers for. And that is, what is the meaning of this common temple? Uh, Latter-day Saints are used to calling this the typology. And some of you are aware of John Lundquist's typology that shows the common ground shared by um, most ancient Near Eastern temples. When I was at uh, 
BYU, of course, we were trained by Professor Nibley that whenever we saw a Babylonian temple, we could quickly find the 21 points that make it similar to us from the Salt Lake Temple, and we knew we were proving our religion true. I had the privilege of studying at the University of Michigan. At the University of Michigan, I studied under a man named Professor George Mendenhall, one of the great scholars of the last generation. Professor Mendenhall had the opposite view on this. He said any time you could find comparisons with the Babylonian temple, you were seeing signs of apostasy. And working between Nibley and Mendenhall, we learned many things, many issues that are raised in our books, and they're serious issues. And uh, the issue can be stated quite clearly, I think, is what is the relationship between common cultural influences in a temple and what we know from Revelation? And it's an issue that has, needs lots and lots of work. And probably the truth lies somewhere between uh, the Nibley approach and the Mendenhall approach. Uh, we're gonna speak just a minute, but Margaret Barker has raised sort of a third approach to this, and she has raised the possibility that everything Josiah threw out of the temple was in fact what was the original part of the temple to start with. The Tower of Babel, you know that story. Uh, it's, it's dramatized here by the ziggurat at Ur. The Tower of Babel is actually an anti-temple polemic. It shows us the abuse of men trying to reach heaven uh, on their own without atonement. Patriarchal worship, as you know and are familiar with, can be summarized by the experience of Jacob at Bethel, a place that means the house of God. There he saw this wonderful uh, display of angels going up and down from heaven. And this is the abbey at Bath that shows these angels going up and down the ladder. I primed my children to go see this wonderful piece of sculpture, and I taught them the wonderful story in Jacob chapter, or in Genesis, where Jacob sees the ladder of God, and he says, this is the gate of heaven, where angels come up and down between heaven and earth. And I took my, my young uh, children out there, and I showed them this, and I said, there it is, it's the ladder of heaven. See the angels going up and down? And my six-year-old said, Dad, why don't they just use their wings? <laughs> Never really quite survived that one. <laughs> Some of you know that within tradition, the Schoon Stone, the Stone of Destiny in Westminster Abbey, is a stone that is allegedly from a Bethel and provided the place of the coronation of most of the English uh, kings and queens. And this is just sort of a, 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 of, of a sidelight that shows you the scope of Solomon's Temple, how it embraces lots of traditions in our world culture. Within history, and we're gonna do this really, really quickly because I think most of you know this material, the tabernacle was the first actual building. Uh, patriarchs worshiped at shrines that of course moved around the country and commemorated places where God appeared to them, uh, made covenant with them, and they sacrificed to him and made covenants back. The tabernacle is the first official building of this temple. You know that at Mount Sinai, Moses received a revelation of the plan of this temple Receiving plans of temples by revelation is also a motif known from other ancient Near Eastern temples. Here we have Gudea of Lagash, and on his lap we see the plan of the temple which God revealed to him in the Sumerian temple. So this is something that's familiar to people in the ancient Near East, that uh, plans for temples are given from on high. The temple represents this gradated sacred space and taught the children of Israel the way back to God. Under the law of Moses, of course, only the priests could actually go within that tabernacle or the dwelling place of God. When one starts doing geography with temple and sacred space, one learns something really interesting here. You'll see on the left-hand side, the center of this, if you take this sacred space and divide it into two uh, equilaterals, or two, yeah, two squares here, you'll see that on the left-hand side, the center of that square is the altar. Uh, or is, is the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant where God manifests himself to man. On the right hand side, you'll see at the center of that space is the altar where God, or where man brings his offerings to God. And thus we have dramatized in sacred space this wonderful idea of man going into the presence of God and worshiping him and being able to enjoy his presence there. You know the instruments in the tabernacle, the showbread table, uh, the candlestick or the menorah and the incense altar. You know that there's veils here with cherubim that guard these sacred spaces. You know, of course, from the movie about the Ark and the Covenant. <laughs> You'll laugh at this, but you can go into a religion class at BYU today and say, how many have not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? And about a third of our classes have not seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. But we are saved because they've all seen Prince of Egypt. <laughs> so they are getting their religious instruction somewhere. <laughs> Looking down from the top, we see the centerpiece of this uh, sacred 
building, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. It represents the throne of God and the place where God meets mankind and where the covenant serves as the mediator between God uh, and humans. Uh, the idea of a portable shrine, of course, has been written about in other Mormon places, but is, is also a well-known uh, phenomenon in the ancient world. And here's one from Egypt where we see a portable shrine uh, that takes the image of, of the God back and forth. Uh, and once again, one of our ideas was that this sacred space in antiquity is always mediated by a priesthood, those who are called uh, to mediate between God and man. The primary thing that was done at these places was sacrifice. Sacrifice is something, the blood sacrifice at least, is a little unfamiliar to us. But sacrifice as the concept is something very familiar to us as Latter-day Saints, uh, as a form of, of worship of, of our God. Solomon's temple from 968 to 586. For about 400 years, an actual building stood on Mount Moriah. This building then serves as the main idea of our book that overshadows all of the rest of history to the present day, this idea of Solomon's temple. We don't think there's a single artifact remaining from this building, and yet this powerful idea continues to influence three great world religions, Christianity, uh, Judaism, and Islam. Here's a picture of Jerusalem at the time of Solomon. You're familiar with that, the temple on the top of the hill facing towards the east, towards the Mount of Olives, uh, designed to greet God uh, or the Messiah when he returns at the end of time from the east and also facing the rising sun there. You'll see the palace down there about the middle of our picture. Solomon's temple, as you'll see from one of the drawings in our book, was a greatly expanded, at least in terms of dimensions, of the symbols of the tabernacle. And we have these large cherubim here. We had the 10 uh, movable fonts of water inside. We had the great um, basin outside on top of the 12 oxen that we're familiar with as Latter-day Saints. And we see the great altar in front. Many aspects of this temple, and we actually have to reconstruct this temple largely by analogy with other ne Near Eastern uh, manifestations of these symbols since we only have literary kinds of descriptions of these objects. But here we have living water, we have trees, we have cherubim. We have incense altars here. If you look on the upper left hand, you'll see the two columns, a Canaanite uh, view of these two columns that we're familiar with in the temple. We see an incense altar, we see a uh, ivory cherub, we see incense shovels, and we see the movable um, basins that were there. And once again, we're faced with this interesting issue about cultural um, kinds of borrowings that might have occurred here uh, versus the, the revelation that we come to expect with the building of temples. There are interesting temples be besides Solomon's temple in ancient Israel, one at Dan, and if you ever get a chance to go, holy, to, go to the Holy Land, this is the temple, you can actually stand right on the high place there. This was the temple of Dan. According to the biblical writers, it was an apostate temple where the golden bulls were. It's, it has the same kind of architecture that, we, that we're familiar with in the sacred space at the temple. We have a temple to Jehovah, the Lord God of Israel at Arad, which shows a basic form of the tripartite structure of Solomon's temple. And these appear to us to have been uh, authorized temples to Jehovah before the time of Josiah, who then overthrew many of these uh, sacred places. And you can see here we have the uh, archeological remains there. So you can actually visit some of these sacred places. Still has the great altar in front, has the stairs moving up into the holy place and up into the most holy place. And you can go stand in these places and observe this sacred space. Baal and Asherah invade our temples in ancient Israel. And the meaning of these um, symbols in the temple is not clearly, or is not fully understood, but we're familiar with these as representing idolatry. And Professor Mendenhall taught us at the University of Michigan that idolatry is when a culture, even a religious culture, puts any interest above God or their fellow men. And he actually taught us that lots of symbols in the temple, maybe even authorized symbols, could have become uh, parts of idolatrous worship. And there's great insight into studying what, what idolatry means, both in terms of symbols and in terms of our individual and personal lives. You're familiar with Josiah. Uh, Josiah cleansed the temple. Uh, he threw out all of these pagan things, and there has been now a movement within Latter-day Saint scholarship to acknowledge the work of one 
Margaret Barker. And Margaret Barker suggests to us that many of the things that Josiah threw out of the temple were in fact part of the ancient old, uh, scholars would call it Yahwism, or the ancient worship of Jehovah. And of course, there remains a lot of work to be done on that. Uh, but she's sort of taking a third position in between Nibley uh, and Mendenhall as to the meaning of lots of these symbols that we find in the Bible. Ezekiel. Ezekiel had this marvelous vision of God on his throne. And I guess Ezekiel really contributes three things to our discussion. First of all, he sees God on his movable throne, a movable throne that has come from heaven and has met Ezekiel in Babylon on the river Kabar. Ezekiel also teaches us that the temple will be restored. It will be restored in the future. And Ezekiel teaches us that one can enjoy the presence of God through vision, uh, not being in Jerusalem, which is the, the basis of lots of the mysticism, both in Christianity, Islam, and uh, Judaism. As you know, in 586, the temple was destroyed. Zerubbabel's temple took its place for about 500 years. And then it was replaced by Herod's temple, a temple that we're very interested in because, of course, this is the temple at the time of Jesus. Uh, Herod the Great, the great builder, uh, reestablished this sacred space on the mount there and reinstituted the practice of religion on a grand scale here. Zerubbabel's temple was somewhat less than Solomon's temple. This was a great building in the ancient world, and Herod the Great was a great builder, and this was an acknowledged uh, achievement. One of Herod's greatest achievements in his life was that he sponsored the Olympics when you're all by himself. So when they say Herod the Great, they certainly did mean he was great. Uh, but this was one of his great contributions uh, to our, our, our idea of Solomon's temple. You're familiar with maybe some of the remains of this building. We still do have a sign that warned anyone from crossing the line from the court of the Gentiles into the courts where Israelites could go uh, and where he would be responsible for his or her death. Of course, there's a great debate in scholarship, one that we won't go into here, is how would one know if one was a member of the covenant at this gate? And some people have actually suggested a circumcision check, <laughs> which of course is probably something uh, that the church will probably just do with barcodes nowadays. <laughs> Maybe I didn't say that right. <laughs> Dead Sea Scrolls. The people in the desert thought that the temple in Jerusalem was apostate. And there they created a temple scroll and the temple scroll talked about a modern manifestation of the temple that would come in the future time to be built before the coming of the Messiah. But maybe more importantly than that, the Dead Sea Scroll people considered themselves as a community to be the temple itself, that this community would serve as the body of the presence of God an idea that was actually picked up later by, by the Christians. 70 AD, of course, Titus destroys the temple. We, of course, are interested in how this temple survives in Judaism. And there's six simple ways that we can do this. Number one, and we'll just go through these quickly. Number one, that from the very beginning, the Jews had the idea of the rebuilding of the temple. And this is the coin, Bar Kokhba in 135, which had a picture of the temple on it. Bar Kokhba said, 70 years are up, it's time to rebuild the temple. I f we found this picture, and this is a marvelous, marvelous picture. On the left, you will see a commemorative plate from Rome that commemorated Herod's temple. And it's right next door to a commemorative plate that was built at the time of the Nauvoo Temple. And that, that deserves a great article somewhere. Uh, commemorative plates. Um, probably will, somebody will do that and start a business. But um, you see this marvelous way of keeping the memory of the temple, uh, even on plates. Pilgrimage. Jews initially uh, made pilgrimage to the Temple Mount. We still have inscriptions in Jerusalem of the pilgrims. And we still see this manifested at the Western Wall where they go to pray as close as they could to God. Number three, the temple remains in Judaism in memory, both in writings and in art. And people like Maimonides added to the already quite large collections of writings in the oral law, or the Mishnah and the Talmud, uh, that recalled for the Jews the exact way the temple had to be, uh, the temple worship had to be carried forth. You can see the pictures here of the temple implements. You will see the story of the tabernacle in an illuminated manuscript. And you can see this marvelous Jewish picture of the Messiah coming to Jerusalem on his donkey. 
you don't often see this in Judaism. You see this, of course, a lot in Christianity. The temple survived at least in the synagogue in terms of synagogues being oriented towards the, the, the pray, people that prayed in the synagogue oriented themselves towards Jerusalem. There's quite a bit of synagogue art we've discovered now in the last hundred years that illustrate um, temple symbols. One of great interest is the sacrifice of Abraham, which of course occurred on Mount Moriah, which is the traditional site of the temple. And quite often we see this picture of Abraham connected with temple symbols because sacrifice, of course, was still at the center of this, of this worship. Mystics in the celestial temple, started by Ezekiel, mystics learned that one could worship at the temple without a temple. And through their mind and their hearts, and through meditation and through uh, reading of sacred texts, these people could achieve experience in the heavenly temple uh, through Kabbalistic and other mystical means. Finally, we have the Samaritans who continue to sacrifice without a temple, uh, but they continue to do the Passover. Finally, temple and Christianity. We're mostly interested in the New Testament from, from my part, then Professor Hamlin will take over from here. As you know, in all of Christianity, Jerusalem always remains the center of the world. And the temple is always a part of the center of that world. And the meaning of that temple has always interested Christians. I just read a book by Eliav called uh, The Mountain of the mountain of the Lord, I think it's called. But I saw in there a quote of Nibley's Envy of the Temple. I haven't seen that quoted for many, many years. And the author that writes this book, he says, Nibley has exactly captured this. The envy expresses both love and hatred for the temple, the envy of the temple. And Christianity will sort of adopt that pose. As you know, and an observation we can make here that's worth noting, at New Testament times, the scriptures of the early Christians was the Old Testament. And virtually everything that we learn about the temple in the New Testament is based on Old Testament things. You know the story of Zechariah lighting the menorah, Gabriel coming through the veil to announce the coming of the Messiah. There was an early Christian story of Mary who worked at the temple. Jesus was presented at the temple by his parents. As you know, Jesus taught his messiahship using temple images. I am the true vine, maybe a reference to the great vine on the gates of Herod's temple. I am the light of the world, uh, given on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles when Jerusalem was lit up. Jesus casting the money changers from the temple, and finally behold the Lamb of God, a description of the Messiah that depends on our understanding of the temple. And finally, book of Hebrews, Jesus is the high priest who comes and atones for our sins by going to the Holy of Holies. Uh, St. John in the celestial temple in the book of Revelation. And finally, the holy city of the heavenly Jerusalem where there was no temple because the Father and the Son were there. Thank you. Uh, try to hurry along so I can have, uh, leave plenty of time for Dan, but I do, do want to note that uh, Dan and I have known each other for, for several decades. We were students together in Cairo. We've kind of had a, an ongoing uh, bet. Whenever we have a dispute about grammar or history or theology or whatever, whoever's right gets to pluck a hair from the head of the other person. <laughs> So, it's not a toupee, guys. Anyway, I'm here to talk about um, the temple in, among medieval Christians. Essentially what happens is the idea of the temple gets picked up by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And throughout the Middle Ages, it's manifest in all sorts of different ways, in art and music, architecture, liturgy. I mean, just, we can go on and on. So we'll just give you a, a sampling, a, a sense of the many different ways in which the temple, the idea of the temple, persisted and was transformed in many different ways during the medieval period. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example, is a surrogate temple. On Easter, the, the high priest, the patriarch, enters into that chamber, comes out with a fire and spreads holy fire, just as the high priest did in the temple in, in, uh, during uh, the Day of Atonement. Uh, temp Greek Byzantine Christians called their churches naos, temples, all the time. It was just very common in the Greek. It usually gets translated as church, so you, you miss it in translations. Eusebius, for example, preserves a dedication speech uh, that was given at the Cathedral of Tyre. Uh, 
which probably parallels what he said at the, at the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And he just goes on and on describing how the cathedral is really just the temple. It's, it's you know, this aspect is just like another aspect of the temple. The baptismal font is the, you know, the brazen sea and on and on and on in every, every way you can imagine. The Holy of Holies is the site of the ascent uh, and, and temples are associated with ascending into the presence of God. And here you've got a, a uh, little ivory panel where you can see uh, Jesus here is ascending up the Mount of Olives. The soldiers are here sleeping. The Marys have come to the tomb. The angel's sitting there. And then the father is sticking his hand out through the cloud uh, and taking Jesus by the hand there. Uh, the Hagia Sophia, a big church made by Justinian for a thousand years, the largest church in the world, uh, was dedicated to holy wisdom, which was understood to be Jesus. And when it was completed, in the descriptions of this church, uh, there's just numerous parallels to temple imagery uh, in all sorts of different ways. And when it was completed, Justinian is su supposed to have said, Solomon, I have outdone thee, or I have conquered thee. That is, he's made a church, a uh, new temple, superior to the one that Solomon originally made. Here's a fellow named Germanos, who was patriarch of Constantinople in 730, he died in 730. He wrote a book called On the Liturgy. And in it, uh, we don't have time to read it all, but uh, you can, whoops. I, <laughs> uh, wrong button. There we go. Uh, he calls the church the temple. He says it represents the Holy of Holies. Uh, you can see here the chancel bar barrier is equal to the veil of the temple. The bishops of the high priest. The Eucharist is a spiritual sacrifice by which they mean a bloodless sacrifice. So the, the conclusion is the church is the true temple. I mean, he went through the whole liturgy and said it's all parallel to the temple. Uh, typologically, the Christians used all sorts of temple imagery. And we'll just give you a few examples. Here's from Ravenna in the sixth century, uh, some mosaics there. And you can see uh, Abel on the one side with the primordial uh, temple shrine of Adam here, and then Melchizedek over here with the temple of Melchizedek. Josephus tells us that Melchizedek built a temple. It was uh, before the temple of Solomon, and the Christians use this and say, well, see, that's our temple is the Melchizedekian temple that antedated Solomon's. It's superior. It's the original form. And here you can see they're both offering their sacrifices. The hand of God comes through the cloud, clouds to accept it, and, but it's all centered around the altar of the mass. Uh, here you've got another typology where you can see in the bottom panel uh, Christ before a cathedral and up above Solomon before uh, the temple. And notice the temple's in the shape of the Dome of the Rock because when medieval Christians went on pilgrimage, what they saw and thought was the temple is the Dome of the Rock and throughout medieval art, uh, the, Dome of the, the temple is often depicted in that way. Here you've got an uh, apse in a church in France in which depicts uh, the... Ark of the Covenant and two grand angels, uh, the, the two cherubim who were described as overarching, uh, overarching the ark with their wings outstretched. So the apse of the church where the altar was is equated with the Holy of Holies. I mean, it's a very clear typology there. Here's a baptismal font from uh, Belgium that uses the oxen of the brazen sea as a symbol for uh, associated with baptism. All sorts of mysticism got involved with temple motifs and symbolism. Uh, especially this book by uh, Richard of St. Victor, The Mystical Ark, where he goes through the Ark of the Covenant and equates it all with uh, mysticism that the medieval monks practice and so forth. But this is a very interesting image because you've got a mixture of the Ark of the Covenant, the, the Merkaba or chariot that Ezekiel envisions with his four wheels on the Ark, uh, the four cherubim on the sides of that, Christ's cross coming out of the Ark of the Covenant and then Christ as God enthroned on all of this. So they're merging all these different symbols together uh, with temple ideas and medieval Christian ideas and so forth. The Crusaders, of course, conquered Jerusalem and established themselves there and they called the Dome of the Rock the Templum Domini, the Temple of the Lord. And the Templars as a movement is, of course, the, the priests or the monks of the temple. They, they had reestablished a temple priesthood there, in other words. Here you can see a map of medieval Jerusalem, and uh, it, on it are depicted the great uh, buildings of Jerusalem, which are the Church of the Holy Sepulcher here, which is the most important. But second only to that is the uh, Temple of the Lord, which is depicted here. And of course, it's the Dome of the Rock. And when medieval Christians came and they said, we visited the temple, they meant they went to the Dome of the Rock on pilgrimage and so forth. Uh, here you've got the seal of the Templars, who became the guardians of Solomon's temple, and on it, on the one side you see their military activities, but on the other side, 
On the right, you see their religious activities, which uh, depicts, again, the, the temple of the Lord as the Dome of the Rock. Uh, when they went in there, they took the rock and built an altar on it. We don't have any ar much archaeology about this, but we have good details and descriptions. And here you can see the altar uh, of the mass put on the rock, which they believed was the place of the Holy of Holies. And uh, they created then this uh, equation between sacrifice of the old temple and the mass or the Eucharist as they understood it. Even the Africans got into this. The Ethiopians were converted to Christianity in the mid fourth century and have a long tradition about Solomonic antecedents of their, um, of their, both their kingship and their religion. And they have traditions that the Ark of the Covenant is kept at the place called um, Aksum. Here you can see the church. This is the church of St. Mary, but the Ark is supposedly kept in this building. If you go to Ethiopia today, you can talk to the people and they'll all tell you, yeah, the Ark of the Covenant's there. So they have this link their own tradition, their kingship, and so forth, linking back to uh, Solomon's temple. Very interesting story about a fellow named Lalibela, who was king of Ethiopia. He had a vision in which he ascended into heaven and entered the presence of God. Notice the angels and Jesus and everybody. This is uh, Jesus uh, enthroned in heaven. Here's Lalibela, here's an angel. And they're all, of course, Africans. Each culture depicts these things you know, as their own people. Uh, the Europeans, the, Jesus looks like a Viking and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's very typical. But Lalibela goes to heaven and he meets God and God instructs him, go down to earth and make a replica of the celestial temple you see here. And so he had, gave him this vision of these, this temple up in heaven and then he, he went back to a place called Lalibela now and, and he did all these rock cut churches. They're cut into this solid rock. They're all one monolithic they're called, just a single piece of stone. And, and he called the place the New Jerusalem. Now, it's called by tourists and people today, Lalibela, but this is an incredible way that this man's visions get transformed, of, of temples in heaven gets transformed into those on earth. Um, Islam has the same type of thing. We don't generally uh, associate Islam with uh, Solomonic traditions, but they're everywhere. Once you start looking for them, uh, it's in the Quran. The Quran talks about the building of Solomon's temple in several different places. Here is a uh, Muslim manuscript showing Solomon uh, over here, the building of the temple here, and these strange creatures are the demons. There's a book called the Testament of Solomon which describes how Solomon uh, got special power from God to bind the demons to make them build the temple because uh, essentially it was something that was beyond the human capacity to do and so this gets picked up in Islamic tradition here in this uh, painting here. Here you've got another uh, illuminated manuscript from the Islamic period showing the, the Dome of the Rock as the temple and over here is Nebuchadnezzar, and this is from the manuscript, it's a historical manuscript by Al-Biruni, de depicting the destruction of the temple in biblical times, and it's the Dome of the Rock. They're clearly equating the two. We've, uh, uh, I've collected several different guidebooks to the uh, Hram al-Sharif, or the Dome of the Rock area, uh, Temple Mount, from printed by the Waqf, the Islamic uh, foundation that runs the Dome of the Rock, from back in the 20s on up through the 60s, and they all just say, yeah, this, this is where Solomon's temple was. Now there's temple denying movements among Palestinians today for political reasons, but everybody up through 67 said, yeah, this is where temple, Solomon's temple was. So they clearly made that occasion in the, uh, equation in the old traditions. Another very interesting thing is Muhammad's celestial ascent, uh, which occurred from the temple in Jerusalem. Now, don't worry about the fact that the temple no longer existed. This is a, a visionary thing that he had. Uh, here you've got a depiction of Muhammad's ascent uh, from an Indian Muslim manuscript, but down here you can see the temple. Uh, there's Jacob's ladder ascending into heaven. Here's the tree of paradise, tree of life in paradise in the third heaven, and then the different layers of heaven that Muhammad ascends through, and in each one he meets a different uh, patriarch or prophet from the Old Testament. This is Abraham there. So you've got this celestial ascent of Muhammad. He, had a, he was uh, in Mecca at the Kaaba, has a vision, an angel Gabriel comes to him, takes him to Jerusalem, it's called the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the furthest mosque, and then from there he ascends into heaven, from, from the temple in Jerusalem. And these traditions, if you go to the Temple Mount today, the Muslim guides will tell you all about Muhammad's ascent from the Temple Mount. Here's a different depiction of this. You can see the Kaaba over here, Solomon's temple here, and then Muhammad ascending on Barak, which is kind of a cherub-like creature, and then the, the, the heaven is opening up, the angels are poking through watching 
Muhammad ascending into heaven. Uh, when Muhammad comes into heaven, he, there is a celestial temple. They call it the Beit al-Ma'mur, uh, but it's, it's the celestial temple. And there, Muhammad, it's protected by 70,000 veils and angels. And Muhammad uh, has to meet these angels and be permitted to pass, uh, to enter into the presence of God there in, in the celestial temple. The Kaaba itself has all sorts of temple imagery. One of the uh, uh, temple books published by Farms has an article about the Kaaba as temple. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, that you can see here, uh, circumambulation, praying towards the central spot. The cubic form of the temple of the Kaaba parallels the cubic form of the Holy of Holies. Both buildings are perfect cubes, which, you know, just is this sacred symbol transposed, as is New Jerusalem as described in the book of Revelation. Uh, the Kaaba has a veil, it's called the Kiswa, and it, it guards the doorway here, and you can see on it, instead of cherubs and stuff, they've simply inscribed the Quran. I think the entire Quran is inscribed on these. This is done in gold thread and so forth. But here's worshipers on pilgrimage coming, uh, worshiping at the veil here. The Dome of the Rock was built on the site of Solomon's Temple and associated in Muslim traditions with that. Uh, we're running out of time, so we, don't, we can't go into the details, but uh, there's all sorts of traditions associated with how the Dome of the Rock was built and what it symbolizes in uh, Islamic culture. Here's a medieval French miniature of the building of the Dome of the Rock by Omar, who's, who's one of the caliphs, and you can see here he depicts it as a medieval cathedral. So there's all this overlapping in, of, of symbols between the different groups. So Dome of the Rock is conceptualized in Muslim tradition as the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. Uh, and of course, medieval Jews and Christians pick up on this. Here is a Jewish depiction. It says, this is, this is our holy place, right there in Hebrew. Uh, and it's the Dome of the Rock, right? Uh, we actually have a picture in the book, which I didn't uh, get a slide of, that shows the Dome of the Rock with a Star of David on the top. It's, it's the Jewish temple. I mean, it is, so it's very interesting how all the different groups are claiming this and using the symbols and recycling them in all sorts of different ways. Muslim mysticism has all sorts of temple motifs as well. Uh, Rumi has a bunch, but the most interesting is Ibn al-Arabi, who had did all sorts of mystical ascents into heaven, in which he enters into the celestial temple, worships God and so forth, and then comes to realize in the end that the true temple is the heart of man where God must dwell, these types of things. So lots of symbolism, lots of allegory, and, and mystical ascents going on in Islam associated with the temple. Here's a fountain in Spain that uses Solomonic motifs. It's got a fountain of water on the backs of 12 lions rather than oxen. There's obviously a little bit of distortion of the tradition, but the same basic thing. And from this flows the waters of, uh, in four different directions to water the garden at Alhambra Palace. Uh, the Muslims also beautified uh, Jerusalem and the Temple Mount in all sorts of different ways uh, and, you know, kept it as a very sacred place, as it's said in Islam, the third holiest place in Islamic tradition. When you come to the modern period, you know, 16th, 17th century and onward, there's all sorts of new ways the temple is conceptualized by many different groups, uh, including Latter-day Saints. Uh, the most famous way for Protestants is, uh, is as a Christological typology. And this slide shows you very well what that is. Here you've got the Temple of Jerusalem as the Dome of the Rock, and, on, and here is the Mount where, uh, Golgotha where Christ is crucified, and notice it's perfectly aligned. That is to say that the sacrifice of Christ is the culmination of, of temple sacrifice. So, so in this painting and in lots of other ways, all of the old Solomonic temple stuff is reinterpreted Christologically. John Bunyan, famous for Pilgrim's Progress, wrote another book called Solomon's Temple Spiritualized by which he means essentially uh, allegorized. But in it, he says, Christ is priest, sacrifice, altar, and all. Everything in the temple had a Christological significance for John Bunyan and many other Protestants of this era as well. You can see the temple popping up in art in the Renaissance, early modern period, in all sorts of different ways. Here's the Peter giving the, uh, given the keys rather, uh, Christ here gives the keys to Peter. And in the background is the Dome of the Rock as, as the Temple of Solomon. Now this person hadn't seen it, He'd heard descriptions of it. Well, what does the temple look like? Well, don't bother to read the Bible. Get some pilgrim to tell you, well, it's a round building and it's got this dome. And so he, he painted it. And that's what he came up with. Others see the, the cathedral as temple. And here you've got uh, Christ's temptations. And here's Satan and Christ on the pinnacle of the temple, which is a Renaissance cathedral, just you know, very similar to the one in, in uh, uh, Siena. But at any rate, the cathedral, temple, it's the same place.
Uh, in the 17th century, you had all sorts of uh, mystical and kind of esoteric interpretations coming up. This is a fellow named uh, Villapando who created a very Baroque image of the temple mixed in with all sorts of hermetic uh, mysticism and stuff. Here's the Holy of Holies according to Villapando. So you get a lot of uh, uh, kind of wild speculations going on here. Uh, but all of it trying to understand and make sense of the, the temple in a different culture. You also, however, by the 16th century, get people who are carefully studying the biblical text and other uh, secondary literature and trying to come up with what they thought the temple looked like. And we're beginning to get something approaching what modern scholars think the temple was like. Uh, temple symbolism pops up all over the place with these columns. These are known as Solomonic columns because when Constantine built the first Vatican, in the fourth century, he is said to have brought, I think it's uh, two dozen columns from Solomon's temple and used them to build the Vatican. He rebuilt Solomon's temple using these columns. And these columns are these twisty ones like this, these, these curly ones. And so they become Solomonic columns. They appear in art and architecture all over the place. This is the Baldacchino of, of uh, Bernini in St. Peter's today, a splendid thing, but it is then becomes the Holy of Holies using these uh, pillars to recreate Solomon's temple in a sense. Uh, all sorts of mystics uh, use temple motifs in many different ways. Sir Isaac Newton wrote a whole book about uh, ancient chronology and so forth and tries to recreate what the temple looked like uh, in, in many different plans. Uh, ma magicians were using all sorts of Solomonic motifs. This is the seal of Solomon used by magicians in all sorts of different ways. But they also ha did what they cr called a magic circle. This magic circle was designed to protect them from uh, demonic powers and so forth, or perhaps to imprison demons within it. But notice the use of all these names of the Lord, Adonai, Tetragrammaton, and so forth. The magicians, by using the name of the Lord, are essentially usurping the role of the high priest, right? when they do this, and that's what they're doing in their circles. Here's a description of how you make a magic circle in a magic book by a guy named Pseudo Agrippa, and a Pseudo is not his real name, but uh, Fourth Book of Occult <laughs> Philosophy, and he says, when you would consecrate a place or a magic circle, you ought to take the prayer Solomon used in the dedication of the temple. In other words, if you make a magic circle, you've got to say Solomon's prayer because you're creating a, a temple by making this, or a sacred space by making this uh, Freemasons, of course, have all sorts of temple motifs. Here's a famous one with the, the compass of, of Christ uh, creating the universe using the compass tool. Here's a very interesting one. This is 13th century, pre-Freemason. Uh, pre but here you've got Solomon and you've got Hiram of Tyre. Uh, and notice he's got a, uh, a, a square there. And behind him you can see the, the cherubs uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. But this is a typological motif paralleling Christ, Peter, and Paul, and the church. So Solomon's temple, the church, Peter and Paul, uh, fulfilling these roles of the builders of the new temple, the new church, and so forth. But we're using uh, what will become a Masonic symbolism with a square there. Here, here's a picture of, uh, used by French Masons equating all their Masonic stuff with temple, all the, all the different temple things here, the showbread table, altar of incense, menorah, and so forth. They're all associated with Freemasonry in that way. There's also interesting movements called Neo-Templar movements, which develop in the 18th century, and they uh, essentially create a new Templar mythology associating them with all sorts of mystical things. You, you, you've picked this up in the Da Vinci Code, if you've read that. The Templars pop up as an as a element in there, and the uh, temple motifs go on. And his, his new book's going to be The Solomon Key, I think, is what it's entitled. So who knows what Solomonic stuff might be in there. Uh, modern scholars from the 19th century on through archaeology have attempted to recreate what the temple looked like. This is a guy named Tissot trying to read, uh, tell us what uh, Herod's temple looked like. Uh, here is uh, Tissot's depiction of the Ark of the Covenant. And of course this gets picked up in uh, Indiana Jones. He, the, the basis of this, the one they used in the movie, was based on Tissot's painting here. Uh, archaeology has uncovered all sorts of stuff. There's a huge archaeological movement and a scholarly movement designed just to try to figure out what the temple was, what it looked like, and, how, and what it means. It's a whole independent branch of, uh, of ancient studies. Uh, here, here, we're running out of time. So there's also a political dimension with the Arab-Israeli crisis, the struggle over who's going to control this temple mount and uh, what we're going to do with it when the Israelis made their seal they took it from the temple vision of Zechariah and Zechariah 4 with the menorah and the olive branches uh, recounted in that. Go read Zechariah 4, look at that seal, you'll see that's what they're doing there. Uh, 
uh, the Israelis captured the Temple Mount in 67, and uh, this fellow Rabbi Gorin on the, uh, this fellow here, and his uh, cohorts tried to blow it up. They were prevented by other Israelis, but here you can see the Israeli soldiers taking over this, and it spawns a whole phenomenon in Israel called the Third Temple Movements, in which they are attempting to Re destroy the Dome of the Rock and rebuild Solomon's Temple in its third form. And this is the Temple Mount Faithful's movement, and it says here, you know, the, the, the third temple. They're ready to build the third temple, and these are cornerstones for that temple that they've cut, and they annually try to go up on the Temple Mount and set those down. The Israeli police always prevent them from doing it because they don't want to start riots and stuff. But there's this strong movement in Israel, and there's an equally strong movement among evangelicals. Now, there's all sorts of ways evangelicals interpret the temple, but if you read Left Behind books, the Antichrist builds the temple, right? He, that's one of the things that happened. I haven't read him, but I, I hope he does, because that's what we said in the book. <laughs> it said it on the blurb, right? So I assume that it really happened in the book. Randall Price is an evangelical who's, who's written numerous books on this subject. If you want the evangelical perspective, he's probably the guy to turn to. So what we end up with then, as after 3,000 years, the temple has influenced art, architecture, all sorts of different ways, theology, and it still continues to be probably the most intractable, intractable problem for the Arab-Israeli conflict. Is it going to be a place that we fight over and kill over, or is it a house of prayer for all nations, which Isaiah prophesied that it would become? And so, you know, if you look at Solomon's temple as this overarching cultural phenomenon, it's everywhere in Judaism and Christianity and Islam. It's really quite amazing. Um, from the fair perspective, there's a couple things you can take a look at. Lots of evangelicals say Christians never built temples or cared about temples. There's just, it's everywhere in Christianity. Uh, there's also all sorts of ascent mysticism associated with the temple. That, that is with a celestial temple in heaven. The real one on earth is destroyed, but you ascend into heaven and visit the celestial temple, and, and that's how you enter into the presence of God, by entering through into this celestial temple. Um, I guess it's time for questions. Sorry we took so long. Too much stuff. When should we stop for Dan? What's that? <laughs> Somebody said they don't want us to stop, Dan. Okay, am well, I supposed to read these questions? And Just, yeah, any questions you want to answer, answer. <laughs> Ezekiel's Temple of the Last Days. Who will build this temple before Christ's advent? I don't know. There are different points of view on this. Um, Elder McConkie thought that the temple would be built before by the Latter-day Saints, for example, right? Some people think the Jews are going to build it. Um, I guess those are the two main possibilities, but I don't, I don't know. There's, there's some interesting uh, parallels between this, the uh, plans of the Independence Temple and Ezekiel stuff. I mean, it's not real explicit, but there's some inter interesting stuff there, but I don't know either. Uh, I can tell you about the past, the future. That's Seely's department. <laughs> How much of the Temple Mount has actually uh, been excavated and documented? Of the Temple Mount itself, very, very little. All around the fringes, they've done all sorts of excavations, but it's very difficult. Well, they just don't excavate on the Temple Mount, right? Right, but recently they have excavated to make a mosque on the, end, on the south end of the Temple Mount, and they've taken all the rubbish to a place just below the Jerusalem Center where Israeli scholars are now going through it, and they're finding lots of artifacts in it. So it hasn't been officially excavated. It's been dug up. But that's the extent of yeah, it. Yeah, I was thinking archaeological excavation. Right. right, but they've dug up all sorts of stuff. I think Mastonic historians claim that it can't be demonstrated. The Masons descend from Solomon's Temple. Can their symbols be shown to descend from Solomon's Temple? Um, if you look at Masonic historians, you know, before late 19th century, they seem to think it's, it, the connections are real. After, you know, 20th century tend to say, no, it's all symbolic. In terms of the symbols, uh, some of it's kind of vaguely, tenuously connected back, but most of it's probably not. Do you want anything? Is there any indication that religious ceremonies equivalent to the modern temple endowment were performed in Solomon's temple? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a general way, there's lots of comparison between spiritual principles we learn from Solomon's temple and 
the modern endowment. Uh, in specific ways, probably there's not very much evidence that those kinds of things were done. However, we don't know much about the practice of Melchizedek priesthood in the, in the Old Testament. It sometimes is a good thing to remember that the Bible that we have is largely an Aaronic priesthood document. So Melchizedek priesthood things we don't know very much about from that time period. I'd, I'd say the, um, the interesting parallels come from the uh, ascent literature and things like that. The mystical literature of the Jews. Uh, Muslims have a severe constraint against uh, depiction of anything on earth. Where do the Muslim pictures come from that have images of men, etc.? Uh, basically, uh, the Muslims are like the Jews in this regard. There are some, uh, you know, regulations that you're not supposed to do it, but what do the artists care, right? And so you will see certain tangents of Muslim art that's very abstract and other tangents where they uh, will depict this stuff. It happens more in Persia than elsewhere. You'll see the Persians are much more into uh, realistic depictions of things, but they will not depict God. You'll see lots of other things depicted. So uh, Islam is a huge phenomenon with lots of different traditions and variations and so forth. We got a few more. Should we do them or should we stop here for Dan? Okay, well, we'll randomly pick this one and this one, and you can read those two. What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> what was the nature of temple worship among non Levitical Jews other than animal sacrifice at specific, specified times? Did they just hang out at Solomon's porch at the Court of the Women for prayers? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, generally, most of the things that we know of that were done at Solomon's Temple were done by the priesthood. However, the people were actively involved in killing and giving their sacrifices to the priests. They were actively involved in prayers and in fasting and other kinds of liturgy that happened there. But they would enjoy that really from outside of the court, uh, outside of the priestly courts. Probably involved in some singing too. Um, and then there's lots of mystical stories about mystics in the temple having visions and things like that. Uh, this person's asked a question about a specific picture. I'm trying to find it here. Uh, I won't read the whole question, but basically the question is, uh, where does this symbol on, it's an uh, octagonal thing, yeah. Uh, the question is, where does this symbol come from? And it's, you can see it on some LDS temples. It's, it's sometimes called the Seal of Melchizedek. And I don't know if, if in this particular 6th century picture it had that meaning or not. But you see it in, uh, it actually antedates uh, this as well, but some early Christian altars have it. And uh, my understanding is that some people told uh, church architects and stuff about the symbol and, and they liked it and have incorporated it in some of our temples. But it's, it's supposedly the seal of Melchizedek. And that's, and you know, you'll see it once in a while in some temples. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.